government can intrude in virtually any area of your life, to me, that's a police state. When you're regulated from a federal government that's out of control, a state government that's out of control, a county government, a city government, and then out in the world, we have homeowners associations as well. You guys kind of have one here called ASU. That's another whole big giant set of rules. I mean, we're almost to the point where what's not prohibited is required. And that's about it. We don't have an awful lot of choices. Although, with that said, there are still far worse places in the world. The question is, which way are we going to move going forward? Are we going to get worse, or are we going to get better? I concluded that speech that I did for that group last year on the note of optimism. I'm actually optimistic. Um, I wish there were 10,000 people here at this talk, but at least there's some people here at this talk. I wondered for years, while all these crazy wars were going on and our liberties were slipping away, if college students even care. So I'm glad there's somebody here. Um, there's no chance that I can tell you everything I need to tell you about this stuff in a short talk. But fortunately, I've written lots of articles. It looks like we've got a few of them here. Um, I got one entitled Legalized Methamphetamine. Don't let that scare you away. I like fun titles of articles. Um, I could have named that Why the War on Drugs Needs to End, but I figured if you can't get by my title, you're probably not open minded enough to really think about what that applies. And I like people outside the box. Um, there's a whole talk I do on the Fourth Amendment. It's another huge area of search and seizure, things that you need to know about there. And then DUI is yet another huge area of the law. We can talk about DUI for 10 hours. It's still not covered. I went to the seminar in Vegas this weekend on nothing but DUI for days because of DUI. So these are vast areas. So I'm going to try to give you an overview of things, and you guys are going to have questions. Keep in mind, this is pretty general type of advice, and so if you have a specific question, specific facts on you, you can throw that out there. By the way, I'm super easy to get a hold of. My website is Attorney for Freedom. What else could it be? Um, if you just go to Attorney for Freedom, or you put my name in Google, Mark Victor, I will come right up. And so, um, let me start. Let me start by saying this rather obvious point that needs to be stressed. In dealing with the police, first plan of action, don't get pulled over by that. Now sometimes you don't have a choice, but a lot of times you do. When you're driving down the road and you've got a tail light out, you've got some obvious problem, registration's expired, some safety issue, you're speeding, you didn't put your direction on something, you're a free pullover. Absolutely free pullover. Keep in mind the state of the law right now. Doesn't matter what an officer is thinking. In other words, an officer is thinking, oh, here's some punk college student from ASU who just left the bar, probably been drinking. I don't have any reason to think that right now. I'll just watch them for a little while, see if they make any kind of a traffic violation. Don't be an easy pullover. So, free stops, lights out, registration. Speeding, turns, I see turns all the time. I had one of those in court today, failing to make a left uh, turn signal, free pull over, your light being pulled board, a billboard for getting pulled over. If you do get pulled over, remember, this is actually the most dangerous situation for a police officer. They can be freaked out on the side of the road, especially if you've got somebody who is young. They're tense and they're stressful situations, very high risk for officers. So you need to keep that in mind. Things can escalate, really escalate quickly and get out of control on the side of the road. The side of the road. I also have an article, I don't know if I have it here or not, that I entitled, um, oh it is here, Surviving a Traffic Stop. Not trying to get out of the ticket or anything like that. Surviving. Why do I title it like that? Because you can die at a traffic stop. You really can. Things can get out of control quickly that in mind. Also remember something else. Nothing's coming out of that traffic stop that's going to improve your life. You're not going to leave there better off than you started. This isn't an opportunity to improve your life. Think of this as a business transaction. Your goal is to survive and to get out of there. So keeping that 
and in wine. Uh, oh, unlimited downside potential and no upside, right? We want to get out of that situation as quickly as possible. So first thing in mind, officer is going to evaluate you right from the beginning. First thing an officer is doing is stereotyping you, putting you in a box. What kind of car are you driving? Are there bumper stickers? What do you look like? Are you disheveled? Are you wearing a, a jacket that says Sons of Anarchy? <laughs> are you covered in tattoos? You look like you're going to be a problem. Are you agitated? That officer is evaluating you. Keep that in mind. What signal do you want to send to that officer? Here's what I say to you. Stay in your car. Don't get out of your car. I'm going to tell you, that's going to get that officer excited just like that. Sit there. Hands 10 and 2. Calm. Um, respectful. Now, you don't have to respect the police. I don't care if you respect the police or not. Honestly, the truth is, there are some good police officers, and there are some terrible police officers. That's just the truth. Just like college professors. There's some really good ones and some really bad ones. Here, you know, sort of the reputation. Oh, Professor so-and-so, he's good. Professor such-and-such, -such, he's bad, whatever. You have no idea who you're dealing with with that police officer. You may have a good one. You may have a bad one. Plan for the bad one just in case. You get the good one, fantastic. So be respectful. Be cool. Move slowly. Officers don't like quick movements. Where are you going to keep your hands? Right there. Don't fumble around because they're going to think you might be going for a gun. Certainly don't seem mad. This is not a social call. It's a traffic stop. You are now interfering with the entrance into the justice system and you do not want to go there. You need to evaluate that police officer as well. There are different varieties of police officers. There's the guy I call the veteran officer. Been on the force a long time. That person is generally going to greet you with respect. How are you, sir? How are you, ma'am? How are you tonight? Probably dealing with somebody who's okay then. Don't let your guard down, but you need to make some judgments about this person. There are sneaky officers out there. You know the sneaky ones, right? Do you know how fast you are going? That's kind of a trick question, right? If you were driving 140 in a 25 mile an hour zone, you might not want to disclose that information. He's trying to get you to make a statement. Then there's the worst variety of officer, and again, a generalization, that's usually very young with a short haircut coming off a motorcycle. Okay? Um, these officers can be very difficult to deal with. These officers might say things like, you know how fast you're driving on my road? Right? This guy's a jerk, right from the beginning. This is the kind of person you need to be most concerned about. You need to act accordingly. You need to do absolutely nothing to excite that police officer. This is not a good time to start getting into, big, into debates about the Fourth Amendment. So let's talk about what the officer can and will require you to do. Stuff you've got to do. Not stuff that, you know, I think you ought to do or, or anything like that. Or stuff that you wish you didn't have to do. This is stuff that you've got to do. And you're going to do. And if you don't do it, they're going to force you to do it. Starters, pull over. Not all my clients pull over. They don't understand it. You know, did you ever see that Chris Rock video? If the police got to come chasing you, you know what they're bringing with them, right? An ass kicking. You can bank on it. Those lights come on, you've got to pull over. This creates a problem right out of the chute. If you're young and you're female and it's dark and it's scary, and especially if you roll in an undercover car with the lights and you're not sure. So this is a gray area in the law. I've got lots of cases like this. Most of the time, if you drive a little ways to a, a lighted area, you're okay. If the drive's a little further than a short drive, they'll say it's a felony flight. I've had people charged with that. If you think you're going to drive an extended distance to get to a safe area, what I think you want to do, call 911. Damn, get pulled over right now. I don't know if this is a real police officer or not. Here's where I am. I'm going to pull over. Please send somebody just to be safe. Why is that important? Because later on, if you get charged with felony flight, that 911 call is coming in to show what we call your men's rate. What was going on in your head? Are you fleeing? 
or are you beginning to pull over? Really important. We've had lots of cases where people have said, yeah, I was going to pull over, I just didn't really know if this was a police officer or not. And the officer says, oh, absolutely, they didn't see me, they knew, they know, whatever. I could read their mind and they knew. <coughs> You've got to cop up the docs. License, registration, proof of insurance. You don't have a choice. Don't sit there and say, well, why? Tell me what I did. They don't have to tell you what you did. You've got to cop up license, registration, and proof of insurance. So you may want to have that ready to go. So this year, I think our best prop that we came up with fairly recently, this document holder. The reason I like this so much is because if you're fumbling around looking for the registration and proof of insurance, like most people, it's probably in your glove box buried under a whole bunch of other junk. The registration's probably expired, right? And you get every six months or something, you take the new one and put it or you just threw the new one in there. Now you got five of them in there, right? So you're shuffling around looking for all this stuff. The registration and proof of insurance, I put that in here. Also, on the back of my business card is what I recommend you say to the police. You reprinted it on the back of this. So how handy is that to have in your hand, at the time you're being pulled over by the police, what to say to the police in the event you're going to talk to them. But you don't have to do what I generally don't recommend. Again, one of those areas of, of uh, difficult to give general advice depends what you've done. If you're driving down the road with 800 pounds of weed in your car, <laughs> you may act differently than somebody who's been five miles an hour over the speed limit. I might recommend a totally different course of action. So, in any event, you've got to provide license, registration, proof of insurance. If you have a CCW permit, concealed weapons permit, which you don't really need anymore, but there are a few things you can do with it, and the officer asks you for it, you have to produce that. You don't have to cop it up unless he asks. This has just came through a year or two ago. I think it's unconstitutional, but it's the state of the law right now in Arizona. If you have a firearm in your car and the officer asks you, you have a firearm concealed in your car, you have to answer that question. And part two of that, he says, give it to me, you have to give it to him or her. Again, I think that's unconstitutional. It's a seizure without due process or any kind of suspicion. And I also think it's a violation of your right to remain silent, but that's the state of the law right now. Uh, sir, are you only if they ask you that? Only if they ask you. I do not recommend, and some other lawyers disagree, and I think they're wrong, I do not recommend copying up that information. Hey, Officer Friendly, just want to let you know, I got a gun in my glove box. If the officer is going to find that, if you get to the point in the transaction where the officer is going to search your car, at that point, or search you when you've got one on you, at that point, I think you should say, hey, Officer, just want to let you know, I got a gun on me, here's the situation. Don't want to get that person excited. But don't go cracking a can of worms. <coughs> Just don't know where that can lead. Again, it's not nothing, there's nothing coming out that's going to improve your life. It can only get worse. Why open your big mouth about the gun? This is another one where people get into trouble. If the officer tells you get out of the car, you got to get out of the car. I get this all the time. Step out of the car, sir. Uh, why? You know, I got to step out of the car. What did I do? Step out of the car, sir. No, I don't want to step out of the car. Step out of the You're coming out of that car. So do the passengers have to get out of the car. That's just the state of the law right now. Even though they weren't doing anything wrong, even though you don't know why you were pulled over. I had this case before. I had a guy who was uh, filming a photo radar protest. And of course, I'm sure the guys with the signs were out in front of the cameras. But my guy was just filming it. Police officer was called. Police officer came said, Give me your ID. He said, I don't have to give you my ID. Give me your ID. This went back and forth. The whole thing was on video, by the way. And um, eventually the officer says, if you don't give me your ID, you're going to jail for failing to provide your ID. He said, I'm not giving you my ID. Family was handcuffed, hauled off to the jail. Just to kind of finish the story, because it's kind of a fun story. They haul him off to the jail, and um, they say, give us your name, or we're going to book you in. He says, I'm not giving you anything. Jail. They bring him out in the morning, bring him out in front of the judge. The judge says, please state your name. He says, I'm not stating my name. I don't have to say anything, and I'm not going to. The judge says, send him back there for me to find out who he is. 
police officer says, roll your finger out for fingerprints. He says, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Cop grabs his finger, pulls his finger out, he pulls his finger back. Cop pulls his finger out, pulls his finger back. Cop then takes his boots, this guy now is now barefoot because he's been booked into the jail, and goes, bam, on the guy's foot. He goes, ow, cop goes like that, and gets his fingerprints. My guy gets, just so you know where we're at in America right now, my guy gets charged with failing to produce his ID. He also gets charged with obstructing traffic. How do you get charged with obstructing traffic? I'll tell you. Because the, it was this theory of the state's case. The police officer had to pull up and investigate this situation, and the police officer parked his police vehicle in a way that was obstructing traffic. And because my guy refused to give his ID, he delayed the officer's departure from the scene, thereby causing an obstruction of traffic. So my guy who was on foot off the side of the road, simply asserting his constitutional rights, got charged with uh, disorderly conduct, failing to provide ID, obstruction of traffic, and two other things. Question? Uh, you been mentioning the ID. When it comes to cop put us over, you know, putting us down on the road, would you recommend asking are we being tamed? Or, like, I do recommend that, but not necessarily right at the beginning. Okay. Yes, yeah, so let me just finish with this guy first, and then we'll probably get to that. <laughs> um, so anyways, the prosecutor went through all the case. We went to trial. We everything at trial because I got the judge to finally, actually really didn't get the judge to finally admit it. I showed him the statute and the judge still sort of disagreed with me. The prosecutor looked at me and said, I think Mark's right. The judge went back and looked at it, threw the whole case out. All five counts were thrown out, not guilty. And then we sued the city of Scottsdale for smashing his, for smashing his foot with their boots and we won and he got several thousand dollars. But that was only because this guy's an activist really want to go through all of that? He could have avoided it by just popping out his ID. I don't know what the right answer is on this, other than to say the threshold question is this. Do you want to be an activist today? Or do you want to just simply be gone? That's the threshold question. Sometimes it's easier to say, you know what, I know I don't have to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because i got somewhere to be and I want to play around. Other times you might say, hey, i got nowhere to be. This might be interesting. <laughs> I'm on the right side of this. I'm going to be completely nonviolent. But keep one thing in mind, and this is something else that the professor did wrong. No matter what the situation is, no matter what you've done or haven't done, or if you're in right or wrong or whatever, if a police officer says you are under arrest, you have to put the hands behind the back, even if it's a totally unlawful or unconstitutional arrest. I don't care how completely wrong they are. Even if they look at you and say, hey, I recognize you, you're this guy, and you're like, no, I'm not that person. Yes, you are, no, I'm not, yes, you are. Yes, you are, put your hands behind you. If you say, no, I'm not that guy, you're going to be charged and likely guilty of resisting arrest. And if you remember, I don't know if you saw that video, that's exactly what happened with that ASU professor. She's jaw-jacking back and forth with that idiot cop. He says, you're under arrest, and she's still talking to him. That was the end. Even passive resistance, even stiffening up your arm, making it more difficult for the officer to put on the cuffs, is resisting arrest today. Keep that in mind. Everything is in favor of the government. I should do a talk one of these days. Uh, here are all the things they told you, uh, you know, in grammar school or junior high or high school about all these great protections for you, like speedy trial and beyond a reasonable doubt and right to remain inside, all this great stuff. And here's how it really works. Anyway, um, just finishing off the must-dos here, and this is where I'm going to get to your question. Um, exit the vehicle for passengers to and remain at the scene. Okay? He, he can tell you stay. I think it's a great question to say, am I being detained? So let me just spend a minute on that and tell you why that's so unbelievably super important. And this digresses just a little bit into the Fourth Amendment stuff. The Fourth Amendment does not apply to voluntary contacts. What do I mean by that? You're walking down the street, there's a police officer, and he says, hey, how are you doing today? And you say, hey, I'm doing great, how are you doing? You're now interacting with a police officer. Ain't no Fourth Amendment, ain't no constitutional issue. There is no seizure, there's no detention. That officer could keep going. Hey, you have any drugs on you? Get into a conversation. 
Would you mind if I searched your pockets? Would you mind if I strip search you? Would you mind if uh, I, would you submit to a blood test, a urine test, or whatever test? Would you like to come down to the station and confess everything you've ever done in your life? No Fourth Amendment issue at all. There ain't no analysis because we don't get past the threshold question. Is this a search or a seizure? If the answer is no, they're not analyzing anything under the Fourth Amendment. How do you figure, and by the way, that's a huge gray here. I have had motions to suppress over that very issue. And a guy was out walking his dog, he had a gun in his pocket, prohibited possessor, police officer pulled up, according to the police officer, engaged in a voluntary conversation with the guy, eventually finds out the guy's got a gun, they charge him. My guy never asked any questions. Officers, I filed a motion to suppress because they had no right to detain him. Government's response, voluntary interaction. Until I found out the officer actually put his lights on. Then he was detained. Once he's detained, different story. So if you ask that question, you clarify that situation. Hey, officer friendly, it's been nice, you know, whatever. I understand you want to talk to me, but am I free to leave or am I detained? They hate that question. An officer can come up to you and just say, hi, how are you? I always recommend, by the way, dealing with an officer in a friendly way. If you've got to pretend that you respect them, you don't have to. I'm not telling you to respect. You're an American. You decide who you respect and who you don't respect. <laughs> right? You make that decision. I mean, you guys chuckle, but God damn it. We're Americans. The government doesn't tell us who to respect and who not to respect. I don't know about you. I don't want any messages from the damn government. I don't care what they're saying. They don't run me. We're in charge, right? That's the attitude of a free person. So adopt the I would encourage you to adopt unless you want to be a slave. My slaves are told what to do. I don't know. I don't tell you what to do. <laughs> you be a slave. It's a different attitude. Let me get to the should too. So I'm going to run out of time. But anyways, I love that question. In a nice way, tend to be respectful. Whatever you got to do. Hey, officer. The officer comes. Hey, hey, how's your day going? How's your day going, officer? Am I today? Am I required to talk to you there or not? Find that out first. You might be surprised by what you hear. A lot of times the officers say, you are detained. Don't get excited. All that means if they find something or charge you with something, I'm probably going to get it all suppressed. Okay, stuff you should not do. Do not volunteer information. Yeah, officer, that is 800 pounds of weed in my trunk. <laughs> Not a smart thing. That's not. People do this all the time. And I, you know, I get my clients in my office and I just look at them and I go, seriously? Really? Well, I figured he was going to find it anyway. Maybe he would have, but we might have had a nice suppression motion until he opened up the door to the mob. Don't lie. I am not suggesting you lie to a police officer. Keep in mind, in the state of affairs that we live under right now in the police state, an officer can lie to you about everything. An officer can totally lie to you, no problem at all. Officers will get, and there's no secret here, officers will get on the stand in court at trial and say, yes, I lied to him. I lied to him to try to get him to speak the truth. They get to lie to you. We've got plenty of court cases out there about that. But you cannot lie to them. If you lie to them, it's a crime. Question. Can they lie to you about being detained? Well, they... If they say you're detained, you're detained. Period. And Fourth Amendment law has very strongly moved away from analyzing what's actually in the cop's head. Let me give you an example. A police officer can say you're under arrest. That doesn't mean necessarily you're under arrest. Likewise, a police officer can say you are not under arrest. And when I say arrest, I mean for purposes of whether we analyze, we lawyers with the judge in court analyze whether they had enough probable cause to actually arrest. They can say, you're under arrest. Or they can say, here's how it normally comes up. They say, no, 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 you're not under arrest or anything. We're just detained. We're here. We're just talking here. Well, they need something called reasonable suspicion to detain a really low level of suspicion. But to slap the cops and actually arrest you, something more, they need to elevate that from reasonable suspicion to probable cause. So they're going to say, well, we're just, just talking here. You're detained, but it's just reasonable suspicion. But if you've got the cops on and you're in the back of the car and you've been moved, you're damn sure are under arrest. So they got to now show probable cause, which allows me to stand in court and say, look, judge, I don't dispute that.
that there might have been reasonable suspicion here, but there wasn't probable cause. The officer's going to say, well, I never arrested him, and then we're going to respond. He might, he might say that, but if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck, and if you're, under, if you're in cuffs and you're in the back of the police car and you're moved, most of the time that's going to be under arrest, but the reverse could be true. I have had cases where they put you in cuffs, put you in the back of the police car for your safety, because you were so drunk or out of control or whatever. All these are things that lawyers make living arguing in court about. So don't lie. It's better to just shut up and remain silent. So you know what, officer? I got a good friend, Mark Victor, and he told me not to answer these questions. And I always like to tag on there. And I'd like to give him a call right now, because Arizona's got some pretty good rules about calling your attorney. If you ask, don't get, don't get upset if you say, hey, I'm going to call my attorney, and they say no. That's fine. In fact, I prefer that, because now I've got an argument that they deprived you of your right to counsel. But if you do decide to call me, which you can do 24-7-365 for free, I'm going to tell you, shut up. <laughs> That's what I'm going to tell. I'm telling you right now what I'm going to say. So it's not that important that you call me right there at the scene, because you know already what I'm going to tell you. So don't answer any questions, but do it in a nice way. Hey, officer, I don't know the answer to that question, but you know, I had this class at school, or I got a friend, or whatever, he told me never to answer any questions I want to call. Don't argue. Do not get into an argument with, I don't care how long they are, how much you think you know about the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or traffic law, whatever. This is a bad, they own you on the side of the road. They have lots of discretion to hook you up with cuffs on you slamming down in the jail and at least put you overnight. What they say sometimes, you might beat the rap, but you don't beat the ride. The ride to jail, you spend the night in jail. They got enough power to do that. I don't think you're excited about spending the night in jail. For DUIs, don't play those games on the side of the road. These are games. In my opinion, my humble opinion, and the opinion of every other criminal defense attorney in this state, these things are BS on the side of the road. You've seen people touching their nose and standing on one foot and doing the pen test, right? Don't do any of those. Now, Arizona law says you have to submit to them if the officer asks you. You have the power to refuse them. What that means is how that shakes out. If you refuse them, they're going to be refused. You're not going to do them. They can't make you do them. But they might be able to comment about that in court to a jury. But still way better than you playing games on the side of the road where you can let a police officer tell your jury how he or she thinks you did on those tests. And I can tell you already how you did. You failed. Okay? You will fail. And don't consent to any searches. I know they might search anyway. It doesn't matter. Don't consent to a search. As soon as you consent to a search, what you've said is, yes, I want to give up all of my Fourth Amendment protection. I want to take away any argument my defense attorney might have to say that this is a bad search. I'm just going to give you the search. I don't have enough respect for the founders of our country who thought that was an important liberty interest, that they would fight and die for it, I don't respect that enough to just say, you know what, get a warrant. I'm not consenting to any searches. My privacy, my stuff, even if ain't nothing there illegal, I prefer not to have some stranger ferreting through my stuff. So no, I don't consent to a search. Some people say they're going to search anyway. They may not, and they may, and they may be a great argument to suppress. Let's go over here and then over here. Yes, you can revoke consent, but you know, you're going to have factual issues about revoking consent. He gave consent, I never heard of revoking consent. Or we revoke consent, but it was after we found all the 800 pounds of marijuana. So to, to clarify, they oh, By the way, you can also limit consent. You can limit consent, too. You can say, yeah, you can search this, but not that. But what's that going to tell the police officer? <laughs> Uh, so if they tell you to do that, you know, stand up one foot and touch your nose and say the ABC backwards or whatever, uh, do not have to do that. Absolutely, positively, you should never, ever, in this state, on the side of the road, ever do those tests. Said another way, 
Anytime you're driving down the road and you see somebody else doing those tests, you should think to yourself, idiot. <laughs> now, I'm going to make a little distinction here so nobody is confused. The tests I'm talking about are on the side of the road you just been pulled over, which generally include the horizontal gaze nystagmus, which is this one. Stand on one foot like this, uh, touch your nose. That's the kind of stuff that they, they also add some things like counting. They can do anything. They, they can ask you to do anything they want. That's the stuff I'm saying you should refuse. I am not talking necessarily about you've been arrested, you've been moved, now you're at the mobile DUI van or at the station, and they're saying, we're going to take blood, breath, or urine. That's a different variety of test. And if you refuse that one, you're going to lose your license for one year. I sometimes advise people to take those, and I sometimes advise people not to. It depends on your situation. That's a good time to call a lawyer. One question here, and then one question next. I was going to ask you, sir, uh, how does search and seizure deal with uh, breathalyzer versus breathalyzer? There are two different varieties of breathalyzers in this state. One we call a PBT, preliminary breath test. It's a handheld. It's what they're going to give you on the side of the road. You refuse that? Stuff on the side of the road, do we do that stuff? No. no. We do not do stuff on the side of the road. We get out of the car, we stand there, we give our license, registration, proof of insurance. If they got a, if we got a gun and they ask, we hand that over. But that's it. We don't do another thing in as friendly a way as possible. Right? Anything you said. And remember, there has to be some context here, too. Have you been drinking? Have you been smoking weed? Have you been ingesting something else? And remember, just for a section on DUI, you can get a DUI for any drug. Illegal drug, legal drug, prescription drug, over-the-counter, Robitussin, Sudafed, sleeping medications. In theory, you go to Starbucks and get the triple reverse latte with all the blah, 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 and that caffeine has got you shaking like this. And that's affecting your ability to operate that motor vehicle to the slightest degree. You can get charged with a DUI. You can get a DUI for any drug, even though you took it pursuant to a prescription. So keep that in mind. This is, if people understood how ridiculous DUI law was, how much DUI is nothing more than a fundraiser for the government, there would be an outrage of people moving to say, you know what, let's delete DUI from our criminal code. Did Mark Victor just say that? Yes, I don't think we need DUI in our criminal code. I know what some of you are thinking. Oh my God, people get into accidents and kill people after having drinking and driving. That's true, that happens. We call that manslaughter. I'm in favor of keeping manslaughter. I'm in favor of keeping aggravated assault, which is what happens when you get in your car, get drunk, and injure another person. That's aggravated assault. I am not in favor of somebody who is the best driver in the state of Arizona consuming a little bit of alcohol so they're impaired to the slightest degree, so now they're the second best driver in the state of Arizona. That's a DUI. And I don't think that should be a DUI. That doesn't endanger anybody. We also have reckless driving. If you drive your vehicle in a way that endangers, endangers another person or their property, that's called reckless driving. If you're not endangering anybody at all, I don't know why that needs to be a crime. Other than if you're a bureaucrat in some city and you want to extract 2,500 bucks for the first time DUIs, for prison construction fees and jail fees, they used to have a technology enhancement fee for the city of Phoenix, and this fee, and that fee, and the Mad Moms impact panel, and counseling that they're going to send you to that you probably don't even need, and ignition interlock for a year, and on, and on, and on. Didn't even mention license problems. So, be careful with DUI. It is so good. Let me just tell you where I'm at on this. I don't care what you put into your body, if you're a big boy or big girl. I don't care how messed up you get. Don't get in your car and drive down the road and be an idiot. If you do that, hey, if you endanger another person, there it is, that's a crime. But are you in charge of you or is somebody else in charge of you? That is really the issue. But I'm telling you where I'm at with the DUI, I don't take one sip and drive my car. I won't do it. It's too easy to get hit with a DUI and they're too serious. And they keep getting more and more serious 
every year. When a politician stands up and says, I think we're too tough on DUI cases. I think we should lower something. The fine should be lower, the jail, mandatory jail should be lower. You know, you stab somebody, uh, well, that's not a good example. You punch somebody in the face, there's no mandatory jail at all. You may go to jail, you may not go to jail. You may have a DUI, you're the first best driver, become the second best driver, you're going to jail. It's ridiculous. None of these laws get less tough. They all get tougher and tougher and tougher. So anyways, um, determine if you're free to leave. I think you should ask, if the thing escalates at all, I think you should ask to call an attorney immediately. You want to get that request out there early and often. And here's another thing that people do wrong all the time. We have something in Arizona called a traffic ticket and complaint. The officer's going to cite you with something. Understand this form does two, can do two, use for one of two things. One, they can cite you with a civil speed or any kind of civil violation. Fail to use your signal when you made a lane change or something. Here's your traffic ticket. Bam. They can also charge you with a misdemeanor crime, something that you can go to jail for. If they charge you with one of those, like DUI, or driving on a suspended license, and they hand you that, they say, sign here. If you don't sign that thing, you're going to jail. All you're signing is that I've been served with this. I got notice of this crime. People don't sign these things all the time. You gotta use your head when you're out there. People unnecessarily go to jail. Even the activists, as I say, I don't think you made any good point here. So sign the damn form. What that really means is the officer is exercising his or her discretion to not take you to jail. That's a bonus. And I can tell you, I can tell you this as certain as the sun will come up in the morning. I've been interviewing officers for 20 years, and they all say the same thing. If he was a jerk, I'm thinking of jail. They all say that. They have a lot of discretion and they know it. The last thing you want is an officer identifying you as a problem so they can exercise their discretion to hassle you. Because there are endless ways they can hassle you. Any questions about any of that? Last point I'm going to make on that, uh, on this area, unless you guys have other questions. If they do arrest you, don't freak out. It's not the end of the world. That just means lots of protections are coming into play. The very first thing, you're going to see a judge within 24 hours. They have to put you in front of a judge within 24 hours for release you. This is why we actually have night court in every county in this state. If they arrest you at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to see a judge before 2 o'clock in the morning the next day. That's kind of an important hearing. That judge is going to decide under what conditions, if at all, you can be released for jail. From jail. Why do I say if at all? Because that's the point. I know it says you've got a right to bond and all this other stuff, but you really don't. Uh, even though Arizona says uh, a bond, there's a preference for an OR release right in our criminal rules. That's on your own recognizance, which is your promise to come back. It also says if there is going to be a bond, it can only be the least onerous bond that will reasonably assure your appearance back in court. But we have tons of people held no bond. No bond for lots of different crimes. I know, I know you're presumed innocent. You're presumed innocent, but you're also presumed a danger to the community and you're detained with no bond. There are people right now rotting away in Sheriff Joe, Joe Arpaio's jail, presumed innocent, but held with no bond on their charge because they're considered a danger by that judge in that first hearing in 24 hours. If you get arrested, and I wish you would be smart to have somebody at that first hearing to get a low bond or argue for maybe you know, an OR sort of line up a bondsman. I don't think it's anything you need to do in advance, but you know, I recommend if you don't carry my card, carry the card of some lawyer so you can make a quick call to get somebody there at that hearing. There's a question over there. So. Oh, okay, that's right. Any other questions on this stuff? Question. I know I already one day one day. I know I already that. But yeah, the cop just so like we kinda have a general idea of what we should do with when a cop does away with town. Because I've had problems with this in my community. Me especially. But um, if a cop does leave you down and you know they're like, oh hi, how are you doing today? You know, you know and you just say, Am I being detained? You said yeah. They say yes. 
I don't know that I would say it at that point, honestly. If there was well, no, I, yeah, like, you gotta yeah, use your head. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, it, when, I, when it comes to that point, and I ask him, I mean, the name, could you say yes? At that point, would it be safe to say something like this that's on the back of the card? You know, my attorney has advised me not to. I, I think it makes sense to say that that's why I put it on there. Okay. Um, it covers a lot of broad events. And, and here's another thing. Um, the reason I, I wrote this and put it on here was because as a young whippersnapper lawyer, I was uh, interviewing a police officer and I was going to make the point that maybe screwed up on the Miranda warnings. It's actually four parts of those. Right to remain silent, uh, anything you say can be used, will be used against you, right to an attorney, and if you can't afford one, you get one for free. they got to tell you those four things. And I was kind of busted on the stop a little bit. How do you know you told them all four? Maybe you told them three. And he said, aha. Uh -huh. And he pulls out from his shirt pocket this department issue Miranda card and said one, two, three, four. So I know I told them all four because every time I read right off the card. So I thought, because I had lots of situations and still do, where people say things, as I, you know, as I, the Miranda warnings say anything you say will be used against you. I say anything you say and some stuff you didn't even say will be used against you. What I mean by that is there's often disputes about what you said. So I like that when people read this, that way they say, I read right off the back of Mark Victor's document holder. So now we know what you said. You said you're not going to consent to the search, right? You said you wanted to call an attorney. These are the things you said. I recently changed this uh, in response to some cases that have come down. Cases come down almost always means your rights are being more and more limited. Um, go ahead. She's next. Oh, so a lot of us as students deal with the ASC police. Um, and as and concurrently with the techie police, can you explain like what their like rules and laws are legally as campus police? Do they have the same power as I, every case that I've ever had with the ASU police has had exactly the same rules. Even dorm searches. Everything has been exactly the same. I can tell you, you know, we have um, I was just talking to some clients about this today. This um, and of course I wholeheartedly support ending the drug war for all drugs, for all common adults, and all crimes, and any amounts, I don't care. Whatever the heck you want to do, if it's peaceful, I totally support it. It doesn't mean I like it, I might try to discourage you from it, but it's your right to live your life. That said, we're at the end of the drug war, at least as to marijuana. It's a really tough time right now, because um, there's so much about the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act that is gray area. I sit around with the other pro legalization of marijuana lawyers and we come up with 25 things that we say, man, I don't know how this is going to shake out. Or here it's all kinds of problems with this. There are endless problems with this. We had a judge in Tucson recently that threw a case out of court, did the right thing, because he said, in essence, nobody can understand the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act. It's vague and we can't understand it and therefore it gets thrown out and that's on appeal and I'm sure they'll find a way to save it. But it's that confusing. So. What I'm getting to here is, here's another issue. Before the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act, officers at ASU used to say all the time, well, we got a call to this dorm room, and I went up to the dorm room, and before I even knocked the door, I could immediately smell marijuana. What that means in a legal sense is, I had probable cause to search that dorm in exigent circumstances. What I mean is, I can walk in and start searching. That's how bad it is. You know, the officer says, well, I've been trained to identify the odor of marijuana, and I smelled it, and now that's it. And I have time for a warrant, I can search the whole place. That pretty much is the state of the law right now. However, now we got people who can legally use and smoke marijuana. So how does that change the analysis? I think dramatically. I think now an officer smells marijuana, who cares? Doesn't even mean there's necessarily a crime committed. I don't think there's any probable cause at this point. That still has to shake up, and judges don't know the answer to that. Or they think they, and you know, judges are human. I talk to them back in chambers all the time. Some of them like this stuff, and some of them hate this stuff. And uh, you know, like Bill Montgomery was here. I heard a couple of days ago. Um, if you want to see something interesting and maybe enlightening, go to Google and put in Mark Victor Bill Montgomery. Because he and I did a debate at ASU. How long ago was that debate? Two, three years ago. Two and a half. Yeah. And so we didn't have the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act at the time. And uh, at the law school, we me and him one-on-one, -on -one, and it was a real fair debate. We both had time to say our piece. 
but you're going to hear a guy who's educated, who's an attorney, who's going to make all kinds of arguments that I think are crazy. And he's an educated, gentlemanly kind of guy, but he's happy to throw you in prison for having a joint, peacefully in your own place. There are a lot of people like that right now who hate this medical so what I found is for people who are accused of marijuana crimes who are outside the protection of the medical marijuana and they are being treated worse than they were treated before the Arizona Medical Marijuana. Alright, um, yeah, good question. Then I want to move on and say a few other things about the thing. what's your take on like a lot? It's like really common nowadays. I feel like uh, people when they get pulled over they'll start building any interaction they have with the cops. <laughs> My opinion is the same as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion, which is where we live in the federal system. You got every right to film that interaction. Yeah, I'm sure should. Now, where the rub is, is you got no right to interfere with the investigation. So you can't take your camera and start getting involved. And that's what the officer's going to say. Get back, turn it off, you're interfering, whatever. But if you're back at a distance and you're not saying or doing anything and you're just filming it, you got every right to do that. So that's not an issue. It will aggravate the police officer nine times out of ten. And they may try to turn that into you're interfering with the investigation. So I've had those too, and sometimes they're not clean. Somebody's filming, and they're also saying, hey, you don't have to do those. You don't have to do those fields. Don't do those fields of right there. Sir, get away. You're interfering with my investigation. If you hear that, you're interfering with my investigation. That means I'm getting ready to arrest you. Just keep that in mind. I've beaten several of those, but again, <coughs> You can't beat the rock. You beat the rap without the rock. Question. I just want to know your opinion on cameras, putting cameras on police uniforms, and whether or not that's an effective way to change um, the culture in the police. You know, it's an interesting topic. Um, perspective is, to me, the most important word in the English language. I don't know if people really appreciate the importance of perspective. Uh, one of my best friends in the whole world is the Phoenix police officer. I know what you're thinking, how could that possibly be? But he's grandfathered in. We've been friends for 25 years, before he was a police officer, before I was a criminal defense lawyer. And we each share our perspectives on things. And um, we've talked about this very issue on several occasions, and he makes some good points. So what if we're just kind of BSing in the car, talking about what happened last night, talking about our family? I, mean, I don't want everything at my job being reported. I wouldn't want that. Maybe that's, that's a perspective. On the other hand, there's all this discussion about the militarization of the police. But he says back to me, Mark, I understand what you're saying. You want me running around with a 9 millimeter? Do you understand the guys on the street now that AR-15s and automatic weapons and I'm supposed to be protecting people with a pea shooter? That makes some sense to me. If the bad guys are running around with automatic weapons, assuming the police are the good guys, and they're supposed to be protecting us, they gotta be able to do something with that. So I understand that perspective. And I wrote an article, and I encourage you guys to read this. Almost all my articles get published on libertarian websites. This one didn't. This one was refused. And I think it said something that was bad about some of the people in the libertarian community. Because this article is Thomas Jefferson correcting. And I love Thomas Jefferson, but if you recall, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, you have liberty when the government feel, fears the people and tyranny when the people fear the government. I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. I think both of those conditions are untenable. They're not going to last. I think if in a free society where the law is not screwed up and you've got peace officers, even the law enforcement officer, you know the guy who enforces every little crazy law? Well, if every little crazy law is in line with libertarian principles, I don't care much that the law enforcement officer is enforcing every little law because every little law deals with a victim crime, is a real trespass. In fact, I want them enforcing every little law. There is no distinction between the law enforcement officer and the peace officer. So if you really want a free society, you've got to get to a society where there's a respect, a real, mutual, not a fake respect, like I'm telling you you need to have for the cops when you get pulled over if you don't. I'm talking about a real respect. Back in the good old days, where you thought of the cops as the good guys. We need to get back to that if we're going to have a free society. To me, any other position is untenable.
Let me talk a little bit about freedom, this, this issue about, I'm going to fly through this. I don't know, how much time do we have? When did we start? Why are you talking you about an hour already? I'll sit here. All right, I'm going to try to do half an hour. <laughs> now you guys can ask any question you want about anything criminal law related, constitutional law related, justice system related, what I think the prosecutors and why, cops and why, whatever you guys want to ask, I'm happy to answer any question. I don't care if you want to talk about religion, pop, any questions you guys have, I will answer. You know, I throw that out at ASU. Sometimes I think you guys are wimps. It's a college campus, man. I feel like people sometimes are, aren't Aubrey enough. Man, when I was in college, I asked anything. It's a college environment. Everything should be on the table. I hope you guys are running those professors are and are just buying everything that they're shoveling up. I can tell you, real professors like that better. Challenge them in class a little bit. Don't just accept whatever they're shoving down your throat. That's just my tip. All right. So the broken state and how to fix it. First thing, I don't like thinking about the state in those terms. Because there isn't a state. There's people, right? There are some people who are bossing other people around. That's what the state is. You can think of it like that. Don't buy into this fiction that there's this big giant state thing out there and it's telling you what to do. There are people who are bossing other people around. That's what the state is. So really, this question about how to fix the state, I think the first question is, are you one of the bosses? Or are you one of the people getting bossed around? Because if you're one of the bosses, first thing you should realize, they don't want to fix the broken state. The state's fine. They're a boss. They do well being a boss, right? I mean, does Barack Obama do better being in charge of the police state? Or would he do better in a free society where he had actually earned everything on his merits like you guys do? He benefits from being in charge of the police state. It's the same argument for my friends up there on a legalized drug. I get in this argument with the DEA guys all the time about any drugs. You know what their argument is? I'm talking about the economic efficiencies and the freedom question and this and that. You know what they're talking about? It's my job. I get paid to fight the drug war. I mean, difficult for me to combat that. So that's the first question. So assuming that you actually do better in a free society, which is most people, or you got some sense of morality where you don't like the concept of your fellow human beings bossing other human beings around. I believe there are probably bosses out there who think that we should have a free society for moral reasons. There's a moral question here. Here's where I think you should start fixing the broken state. Look in the damn mirror. Look in the damn mirror and figure out, are you part of the problem? I talk to groups all over this state, all over the place, different groups. Yeah, I talk to the legalized marijuana groups, the gay groups, the gun groups, the biker groups. I'll talk to any group that wants to listen. Everybody says they're for freedom. But you know what? Most people are still part of the problem. But what is the problem? I can tell you what the problem is in a nutshell. We don't have enough people who have their hearts in their minds pro-freedom. We don't need everybody. We just need enough. It's like the American Revolution. There are estimates that only 10% were for revolution. 10% were for the crowd. And 80% just said, let me know what flag I need to fly. They didn't really care. It's probably not that much different today. I hate to say it. But the good news in that is we may only need 10%. We only need a certain critical mass of people to be pro-freedom. So what the heck do I mean by pro-freedom? Because I know any crowd I speak to, I can say, raise your hand if you're for freedom. Right? Everybody raises their hand if they're playing along. Nobody says I'm not for freedom. Hitler said he was for freedom. Stalin's for freedom. Saddam Hussein is for freedom, or was. Everybody's doing it. I'm not inventing that. I wrote an article about that one and started with quotes from those guys. That sounded like great quotes. Everybody's for freedom. I define it broadly. I try to make it a big tent. But it still needs to be a real tent. Here's how I divide it up. To me, there are two groups. One group is for freedom, one group is not for freedom. 
how do I define break those groups down? It's really not that complex. There's one group, the group of people who thinks that it's wrong to impose your will on other people by force. We think coercion is wrong. I don't like to boss my fellow human beings around. Then there's another group. They think it's okay to boss their fellow humans around. They're arguing about stuff. What are they arguing about? What areas should we boss our fellow humans around? I call them the Republicans and the Democrats. They're both fine with bossing you around. They're arguing about what things they should boss you about. Right? I mean, the Republicans want to generally tell you what to do in your bed. They want to tell you about sex, this and that. And all the, the Democrats want to tell you what you can spend your money on. And they want to regulate everything. They're not that different today. It's getting harder and harder to draw those distinctions. To me, pro-freedom means you're in the voluntary interaction box. There's only two ways that human beings interact with each other, and that's it. Voluntary or involuntary. That's it. You can get every interaction that humans have in one or two of those boxes, and all we are saying is if it's in the voluntary box, it ought to be legal. That's all. And if it's in the involuntary box, it ought to be illegal. Another way of saying this that a lot of libertarians, and I don't usually use that word because there's some connotations and confusion about that. There's a libertarian party of which I am not a member. And then there's a libertarian philosophy, which is much broader. So some of them say the non-initiation of force principle. I like that too. I don't initiate force against anybody. I get guns, I will never initiate my guns or guns for defensive purposes because I'm not an initiator of force. Are you an initiator of force? If you are, you are the problem. You might seem like a nice person, but you are the problem. Keep in mind here, people get confused about things. Just because I think it's something ought to be legal, doesn't mean I like it, doesn't mean I do it, doesn't mean I wouldn't try to talk you out of it. All I'm saying is you're in charge of you. You don't have a right to do stuff that I just think is okay. Right? Can I ever be big enough to make a distinction between this is something another person ought to be able to do, but that notwithstanding, I would never do that. I think it's stupid, it's unhealthy, it's immoral, it's bad, I'll try to talk you out of it, but support your right to do it. If you can't do that, don't talk to me about wanting a free society, because you've got no clue about a free society. Again, you are part of the problem. I wrote an article about this over there titled, Are You Really for Freedom? And that's what I'm talking about. The big boys of freedom or the babies of freedom. The babies of freedom say, I know. And I usually say this to the pot smokers. They think I'm coming in as their pal. And I like to tear them up. Who here likes medical marijuana? They say, yeah, me, I like medical marijuana. Who here thinks we should smoke? We should get to smoke weed recreationally just because we want to get high if we choose to. And everybody else comes down, right? And I say, who thinks cocaine ought to be legal? Yeah, yeah. Who <laughs> big boys and girls and free? And I don't, I've never used it. I discourage you from your I, It's none of my damn business. I don't want to tell you how to run your life. Most of the methamphetamine? Yeah. yeah. This is a good this is warm in my heart right now. I would never use meth. No. I would never use meth. But damn it, I support your right. As long as you're peaceful, to do whatever you want. As soon as I say that, I'll do my best to talk you out of trying it. Those are the big boys and girls of freedom. Are you a, are you a freedom win? Oh, I support the rights of other people to do stuff that I do myself. Oh, you're such a freedom guy. You're a freedom guy. You're a positive We should be the big deal. That's a big zero on the freedom scale as far as I'm concerned. If you're not a pot smoker, do you support the rights of people to smoke pot? That's the question that helps me understand if you're really for freedom, right? That's what I'm talking about for a free society. I don't think most people understand that. And I get so frustrated with the gun guys. Are they for gun rights? Well, let me guess, you're a gun guy, right? Wait, great. The weed guys are for weed and the gay guys are for gay marriage. I am so not gay. I got a beautiful wife up there operating the camera. I am the biggest pro-gay, get married, do whatever the hell, I don't care, right? I think I can speak on that issue because I'm automatically a big 
political freedom on that issue. I'm a non-gay person fighting as hard as I can for gay rights because I don't care what people do peacefully in their own bed or any other place. What business is it of mine? I'm an American. I'm trying to put forth American principles. By the way, I think freedom is really important. This isn't, some, this isn't just some convenience. If you don't think freedom is really an important issue, you are a part of the problem. And you will not appreciate it, maybe, until you're at risk of losing it. You want to see someone appreciate their freedom? Let me show you some of my clients who come into my office charged with major felonies, which, by the way, are lots of times in marijuana cases, and they're at risk of going to prison. You think money's more important than freedom? I can promise you it is not. You ask anybody who's at risk of losing their freedom. Money is way less important than freedom. There's lots of, and I think money's important. I'm a capitalist. I don't minimize that. Money's important. Get your degree, go out, and make as much money as you possibly can peacefully. And have fun and spend it any damn way you like. Money is important. Money is way down the list from freedom. Not the rich guys that are in prison. They'd give it all up in a second for their freedom. Your health, way more important than freedom. I'd say the quality of your relationships, I hope you guys are big enough to figure that one out. Way more important than money. And also, I'll tell you something else. Your integrity. Way more important than freedom. And if you've ever lost your integrity or violated your own integrity, you probably felt that. Everything I've said to you here tonight, I'll say anywhere, at any time, in front of anybody. Because it's just part of who I am. It's about having integrity. We need to spend more time winning hearts and minds for freedom. That's how you fix the broken state. We need to get out there and do things. We can try to get some agreement on fundamental principles. We need to win hearts and minds. Without hearts and minds, nothing else matters. I don't care who's in office, who's running, what proposition gets passed, what we can sneak in, what we can get on. None of that stuff matters. It doesn't matter what the Constitution says. I've said it a million times. It doesn't matter. You know what the Fourth Amendment we've been talking about tonight? I can tell you all kinds of cases about the Fourth Amendment. That's your right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Sounds great, doesn't it? Said another way, Here's how the Fourth Amendment ought to read. It means exactly the same thing. The government can search or seize anyone or anything, anytime it wants, for any reason or no reason at all, so long as the government decides that what the government did was reasonable. That's, the fourth, that's what your Fourth Amendment protection amounts to. And you know what they decided at the border? Anything at an international border, if it happens there, it's reasonable. Said another way, the Fourth Amendment has been deleted from the international border. Why am I bringing this up to you? Because it's about the hearts and minds of those people on the Supreme Court who are deciding what's reasonable. I can promise you, you put a different nine there, let me hand pick my nine, you don't have to change another thing. We don't have to pass anything. We don't have to modify anything. I don't need any amendments. We'll just take people with hearts and minds that are pro-freedom and let them interpret what's reasonable. We need to argue about this stuff forcefully in a friendly way. I'm going to get to your question right there. I'm getting close here. Here's something else that I think is important. This is for the big boys and girls of freedom. I think a lot of times we're tearing each other apart unnecessarily. I think there are two really important, really different discussions about freedom that we get into, and I've seen it a million times. Discussion number one, how would a free society work? How does, what does it look like? How would we get this? How would we get that? How would we get this? That's an awesome discussion, and I love it, and we should have it. We need to have it. We need to challenge everything and everyone out there and say, you know what? A free society works really good. This is how it would work. But then there's a second, totally different discussion, which kind of could be titled like this. Given that we currently live in a police state, given that we are where we are right now, how do we get out of this situation and head towards a free society? 
people have totally different opinions on it. I'm most interested in discussion number one. Are you a big boy or girl of freedom? Then we can kick our ideas on do we just lower taxes? Do we do medical marijuana, which is wimpy, right? Medical marijuana, what a wimpy. Oh my God, it's painful to sit here and have to say, Oh my God, he's got a pain. He's got chronic and severe pain. So he can get a permission slip from his doctor. So he can get a permission slip from Big Brother. So he can smoke a joint and control his own body. What an embarrassing, miserable, stupid, un-American thing to have to do. But on the other hand, we're moving in the right direction. And I'm optimistic about that. But let's call it what it is. I don't, when I talk to other freedom activists, I say, let's not call it medicine. Maybe I'm not trying to say it doesn't help people. It does. I know it does. But it's not medicine. It's weed. If you want to smoke it, and you're an American, and you're free, and you're peaceful, it's your business. Remember, freedom's always defended at the edges. Nobody fights over mainstream stuff. You want to defend freedom? You're at the edge in all of these areas, right? First Amendment free speech. Yeah, you've got a right to say anything you want. Nobody complains when you say mainstream stuff, right? That's not what you defend the First Amendment. If I'm going to be a First Amendment guy, and I damn sure am, I'm looking for the case where someone is saying something so heinous and so offensive and so miserable. Where am I going? I want the hate speech. I want the, you know, um, the white supremacist idiots, I want the Nazi idiots, I want all these people saying the dumbest things, but they're peaceful. You want to defend First Amendment free speech and you don't have a stomach for that? You're not a First Amendment free speech person. They're all like this. You know where the Fourth Amendment gets defended? In cases where stuff is found, which means you're always defending the criminal. When they search your vehicle and nothing's found, there ain't no Fourth Amendment case. It's when they find a dead body in the trunk, and it's a bad search. And here comes Mark Victor and say, hey, we need to suppress it. Yeah, that murderer needs to go free. Because the government screwed up, and freedom is more important. You want to defend the Second Amendment? Who knows about Dr. Steinmetz? Yeah, you guys do. He took his AR-15 to Sky Harbor Airport and bought a cup of coffee and sat down. You guys have seen this case? Put it all over the news. <laughs> Steinmetz is my client. Too much smoke on the internet. <laughs> That's a Second Amendment at the edges, right? I'm peacefully walking around with my AR-15 at the airport sipping on a Starbucks because I can. <laughs> Hello. He did that before he met me, and I would not have advised him to do that. <laughs> but he's an activist, and if you saw, we did a press conference at my law firm, and we, we made a statement of why he did what he did. The Second Amendment, like all other freedoms, is defended at the edge. Due process gets defended in tough cases. There are wimpy criminal defense lawyers out there. How do I know? I take over their ugly cases that they're afraid to represent people on. Yeah, I take the ugly child molest cases, the rapists, the bad guys. Why? Because damn sure, if I'm representing it, they're going to get a fair trial. Every I will be dotted, every T will be crossed. Because even this miserable you-know-what, that guy gets a fair trial before we chuck him in a cage like an animal. You want to cut corners on that guy? There go your freedoms. Somebody's got to fight that fight. You know that show with the guy who does the Ford commercials, the dirty jobs? Yeah. I got the dirtiest job in America. It's called defending our Constitution. It's not the cops, and it's not the prosecutors. It's the lonely defense attorneys who are defending the people that everybody hates. Did you guys see my trial when I defended Elizabeth Johnson in the baby Gabriel case? That's another one. All you guys know that I'm like, she took her kid from Tempe to San Antonio against the custody order, and then when baby daddy said, where's the kid, she said, I killed him. And then baby daddy called and recorded the call, and she said, I strangled him, took his blue body, wrapped him in a diaper bag, chucked him in the trash. And then we had searches of landfills throughout Texas for a year. Baby Gabriel was never found. Elizabeth Johnson was my client. She was trying here a year and a half ago, maybe. 
and she was hated. She was hated across America, and it was one of the most satisfying trials I ever had in my life. And now she's walking the streets because she wasn't guilty of the kidnapping they charged her with. Freedom and democracy, don't let them put those two things together. Freedom is sacred. Democracy's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Two wolves and a lamb thinking about what to have for dinner. Right. It's tyranny of the majority over the minority. I don't care much about who's imposing their rules on me. It doesn't make me feel one damn bit better than it's the majority that's bossing me around <laughs> over some iron-fisted dictator. What do I care? I don't control the majority. I don't want to be bossed around. I want to be free. Don't let them put... Like George Bush used to do, freedom and democracy, democracy, like they're the same things. And we stupid Americans swallow that and accept it like it's true. We're going to spread democracy. Really? We're going to spread tyranny of the majority around and pretend like that's freedom? And you guys are going to buy that? Don't buy that. In fact, they're mostly incompatible. Freedom is self-rule. Freedom is I'm in charge of me. Democracy is everybody's in charge of me. The majority's in charge of me. That doesn't excite me. But it was okay at the beginning of our country. You know why? Because very few things were up for a vote. Today, everything is up for a vote. There ain't nothing that's off the table. If I want to tell you what to do, all I got to do is get a vote together. And if I can get the majority of people to agree, it happens for the most part. Founders were aware of this. This was the purpose of the Constitution, to take stuff off the table. I find myself constantly arguing with imbeciles who say, hey, Mark, the majority wants to do this. Why can't we do it? Well, because people have individual rights. That doesn't matter what the majority wants to do. The majority doesn't get to tell them in this area. Unfortunately, your rights have your protections, the stuff that was off the table has been shrunk down to very little, almost nothing. And their ability to regulate anything, right down to the amount of water in your toilet by the federal government, is expanded. Personally, I'd rather have a Ron Paul iron-fisted dictatorship than the majority of idiots telling me what to do. A couple more points. Peace. I love peace. I'm a huge peace activist. I wish I could have talked to John Lennon. I'm going to find out if he really was for peace. Come to my house, in our pool we have a giant peace symbol. I'm a huge fan of peace, but I don't talk about peace that often. The reason I don't talk about peace is because we don't even have freedom yet. And if you think about it, you cannot have peace until you first get freedom. What do I mean? Freedom is about we're not hitting each other over the head, right? We're not coercing each other. But if we're still coercing each other, how can we possibly have peace? We're still forcing each other into doing stuff. The only reason I'm a freedom activist instead of a peace activist is because I acknowledge we got to get to freedom before we can even talk about peace. Peace is something in addition to freedom, right? We could have a total free society. And I could walk out my front door and say, screw you to my neighbor. I hate your guts, you dirty, rotten, blah, blah, blah. As long as I don't walk over to his property or chuck a rock at him or do anything, we got a free society. We're angry at each other. We damn sure don't have peace, but we got freedom, right? We can have freedom without peace. The second we get freedom, I hope we see it in my lifetime, I'm going to be a peace activist. I'm going to encourage people to say, you know what? Maybe life is better if you're not screaming at your neighbor. Maybe you should walk out the door and extend your hand and say, hey man, what can I do to make your life better? Right? If you want to get into that love thy neighbor stuff, I am not a Bible guy, but there's some sense to that. But we should call these peace activists on this stuff. Seriously? You're going to wear a peace symbol and you're not even for freedom? I hope you call these people on it. I do. I catch you wearing a peace symbol, I nice come up to you and ask you about peace. And I'm going to ask you about freedom. I might start with the drug war. Oh, I'm your friend in the drug war. Well, I'm really friend. Seriously? You want to take people who 
who are controlling their own body and throw them in cages and lock them up like animals, then you're for peace? Don't let them get away with it. It's popular to say you're for peace. But we need to make the case for freedom. We haven't even made that case yet. Don't let them get away with pretending they're for peace. I don't know why this freedom thing's a hard sell. It shouldn't be a hard sell. I like to make it really simple. How about this? I'll be in charge of me. Like, I'm in charge of my stuff. You, you could be in charge of your stuff. Why is that so difficult to say? I mean, sometimes I sit around with my friends and we think, what's the alternative? I don't know. Let me think about this. How about, uh, I'm in charge of me and I'm in charge of you. you want to agree to that one? No, that doesn't seem to... How about you're in charge of you and me? How about we're all in charge of everything? I mean, what makes sense to me? I don't know. What makes sense? What do we teach our kids in kindergarten, right? you got to ask permission. you got to play with somebody else's toys. you got to ask them. You don't just go take stuff from people. Why is that wrong? Because it's initiating force. Somehow we understood this when we were little kids in kindergarten. And then we became adults and we thought, well, if we vote on it, <laughs> if it goes to this big giant government thing we pretend, right, it's okay to have some people bossing other people around, right? If, if I go and grab your wallet and I steal your money and run down the street, we can identify that as wrong. But if I got a shiny badge and a tax code and people in Congress agree that it's okay to steal your money, well, it's okay. We'll just call it something different. Let's call it taxes. We'll even use it for stuff that we say is important, right? How would you like the thief to stick the gun in your hands and give me your money? And you say, no. And he says, I'll kill you if you don't. And he says, look, I'm going to use it on good stuff, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to give some of it to charity. I'm going to give some of it back to you to help improve your life. <laughs> and you guys laugh. But that's what's happening. That's where we are. They throw a badge out there and call it taxes, and it's okay? You guys can't identify that? I know you guys can. Perspective. Super important. I really don't have enough time to cover this, but I think we need to start looking at things from the perspective of other people. We've all been brainwashed by our culture, by society, by our teachers, by our parents, by whatever. We need to get out of that. Just as a little example about changing perspective. We went to, um, <coughs> we went to Alaska recently. And we were up in a, one of those planes that flies off the water. And Alaska's big. I don't know. I, I didn't really understand how humongously massive Alaska is. Like, we, we cruised around with the different... We didn't see nothing of Alaska. Well, if you, let me tell you what. If you've got an arrest warrant out for you and you want to hide somewhere, forget about Mexico. You can disappear in Alaska. Alaska is massive. From my perspective, Alaska is like the biggest place ever. But I started listening to some stuff Stephen Hawking's been talking about. You know who Stephen Hawking is, right? Stephen Hawking, from his perspective, Alaska ain't so big. I mean, he explained that, you know, the Earth is just one little speck of dust in our solar system, which is just a speck of dust in our entire galaxy, which is one little speck of dust in a huge universe of tons of galaxies. From the Stephen Hawking perspective, Alaska is nothing. You change perspective, you can look at things totally differently. We need to do that with people when we're talking to them about freedom. On the meth users, just to return to that for a second, yeah, I wrote this article about legalizing meth. You know, it, it got published, I got emails internationally. You know who attacked me more than anybody? Meth users. Because I conceded in that article that meth is bad and it'll destroy your life. I still think that. But you know what? It never dawned on me why people use meth. I've had occasion to talk to several meth users since then. And you know what they tell me? There's an upside. I'm like, no shit. You mean you didn't use this stuff just to rot your teeth out of your face? There's some benefit to it? It never crossed my mind. Did you ever think of it from the perspective of the meth user? There's a reason they use that meth. They explain to me it does this, it does that, it does that, <laughs> whatever. There's an upside, there's a downside. They made some evaluation and they like it. That's their judgment. I'm not going to substitute my judgment for some other person's point of view. 
I know people who jump out of planes, right? And they pull the parachute, that's fun for them. I don't get that. <laughs> I don't do that. But from their perspective, it's a fun thing to do. I'm not going to substitute my judgment for another person. But I think if we're going to understand each other, we need to try to look at things from other people's perspective. One last story, then I'm out. Am I over time? A little bit. Um, we were on this Alaska cruise recently. I'll just tell you this story, something that just made me think. Um, there were lots of Americans, lots of Canadians, and lots of Australians on this thing. This guy comes out, he's going to play violin. He comes out, he's getting ready to play America the Beautiful. And he explains that he was born here, and he lived here, and he's, he's proud to be an American. And he says, who here is proud to be a Canadian? And a lot of people go, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, who's proud to be an Australian? The place goes crazy, like the Aussies, man. They're loud, they're like party people. And then he says, who's proud to be an American? And it was hardly a peep. <laughs> and I thought for a moment, this is really kind of sad. There were a lot of Americans there, but nobody really wanted to pipe up and say, yeah, man, I'm proud to be an American. And the dude starts playing this America the Beautiful song. It really was a beautiful song. It's all these songs, you know, free, like all our songs, right? Liberty and freedom. We're great, we're great at singing songs about freedom. Really bad at walking the walk. We love to talk to talk about freedom. For the highest incarceration rate in the world, we talk a lot about the land of the free. <laughs> but I'm thinking about this beautiful song, and I'm thinking, man, there must have been a time when a lot of people really were proud to be an American. I mean, think about how far that is. And you know, deep down, I still am kind of proud. What am I proud of? I'm proud of that sort of philosophy, what started, our country started as this great experiment of freedom. These guys were as close to pro-freedom as there was in the world when they started this country. And I started thinking about it kind of from their perspective, what it was like to be a proud American. But then, you know, I started thinking about it differently. And I thought, yeah, that would have been great unless you were black. Right? What if you were black? And you were a slave in that same America. How would you feel if you were being paraded around in chains like an animal, hearing us sing songs about the free and the great experiment in freedom that is America? I'd be pretty pissed off about that. And I'm thinking about that from their perspective. And then I thought, this thing, while maybe the best experiment at the time, it was flawed right from the beginning. Thomas Jefferson and these guys said great things. But you know what? I've always been bothered by the fact that he never freed his slaves. I can't really get behind a freedom guy like that. If he was here, we'd talk, but I'd say, you know what? I can't, I just can't count you as a freedom guy. And so it made me think a little bit about, man, could we reboot this thing? We know so much more about freedom now than they did then. They were the state of the art on freedom, and they're still enslaving people. They were pretty far from really having a good understanding. We have so much more right now, so much more that we understand about the nature of government, the nature of people bossing other people around. It's, it kind of inspired me to think that we really could be, we really could reboot the thing and maybe start this experiment, point two, America 2.0 or whatever, and uh, do it right this time. And on a point of optimism, I know you guys may remember that whole Serbian-Croatian thing. Man, I need more Serbs and Croats on these things. I always ask them. My wife Tracy will tell you. I go to the Serbs and I say, hey, how do you feel about the Croats? And I go to the Croats and say, hey, what do you think about those Serbians? And I always get the same answer. Several different cruises, several different Serbs, several different Croats. You know what they say? We don't care about that stuff anymore. We all realized that was just political <coughs> bullshit. On a one-to-one -one level, the Serbs and the Croats, they love each other. They got past that crazy stuff. And they're totally they're just brothers and sisters. They're just human beings enjoying each other now. If the Serbs and Croats can take peace, why can't we make progress here? I think we can. I think we only got to get to a 10%, at the most 30%. I think it's doable. So I'm optimistic about the future. I think we need a revolution. 
The revolution, remember something, the American Revolution, as stated by our founders, was not the war. It was not about guns. It came to that, but it was about a revolution in thinking. That's the big takeaway from the American Revolution. We need another revolution in thinking, and uh, hopefully you guys can get behind that. I would encourage you to do whatever you can. To the extent that I can help you at all, I'm always available. I know I'm way over time. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate it.
drug war has done to the liberties of this country, not even to mention the number of people we have living in a cage right now today, that is a moral outrage.